is the General Electric Model 3-6035A slash B. And the reason I say A slash B, I'll get into in a brief minute. Forgive the cut to this. I forgot to mention, I um, call this the Blockbuster 2. Even though that's not its official name. It doesn't have a model name, like the Blockbuster. I call it that because it has the same speakers, as you could tell. So, you know, same speakers, very similar cosmetics, and the same amplifier, the, H the Hitachi HA1392. So, yeah, it's like a improved version. You can see how much bigger it is than the Blockbuster, and the Blockbuster is already a pretty decently sized boombox. But yeah, it is. It was made from 1982 to I believe late 80, 1984, and it's a very unconventional boombox style from that era. I mean, for one, it has digital tuning, digital clock, digital timer. And another thing that makes it unconventional. Look at the depth of it. It's very unique and once again it performs better than most boom boxes out there of this size in fact it outperforms a lot of bigger boom boxes with eight inch speakers and stuff so once again it is yet another funai oemd boom box and i do have this fascination with vintage funai as in pre-1992. Funai used to make really well-made and fantastic performing products, and this is one of them. As mentioned, it's made, it was made from 1982 through 1984. Now, what is the difference between the A and B versions in terms of cosmetics and performance and the parts? Pretty much nothing. The difference is where it was made and consequently by whom. The A version came first and appears to have been made from 1982 through 1983. The B version came from late 83 through 84. I don't know if this ran in 85 or not. And the A version was made in Funai's Taiwan plant. The B version was uh, since I can't find a clone, this may have been a one-off model they made for GE. And the B version was made in General Electric's own Singapore plant. And it was basically assembled there, uh, including the circuit boards. Same circuit boards, but they used their own s suppliers of components, which I'll get into. And I know someone else is going to ask, um, why did... Did GE ever make their own boomboxes? And the answer is yes. And I'll show that. they Their boom boomboxes were mostly entry to lower mid. If you get them. Now this is an actual GE made boombox out of the Singapore plant. And you can tell it's more GE like. Like the fonts. the How everything's laid out. And what it does. It's not a bad boombox. It's heavy. I mean, it's very well made. It's from 1982. Metal handle and everything. But it's entry level. Sounds pretty good regardless. But I'm just saying, it's just an entry level unit. And that's what I've started to notice is, once you get past the entry level slash lower mid, then they started um, OEMing out their stuff. This one will be restored for a later video. Now, the reason why everything else, all these, these ones right here were... OEM'd out was because of my theory cost. It was probably cheaper to OEM out the higher end units because the entry level and, and stuff would have been the big sellers. But in doing so, they created some of the most, some of the best performing boom boxes and most underrated too. Like you wouldn't, this thing. Between this, the Blockbuster, and the Realistic Powerhouse boombox, all Funai OEMs, they kick royal ass, okay? 
Now, it's not to say Funai wasn't the only OEM supplier GE used, uh, but they did make a majority of them because General Electric also used Sharp and they also used Pioneer for this 1985 model. So that said, yeah, in the North American market, the biggest suppliers or biggest um, brands that OEM'd Funai would have been General Electric, Realistic, as in Radio Shack, and, and Sears. If you have a Sears with a model number 304 beginning, it's a Funai. Okay, so yeah, I'll get into some, some other details later. So this is the boombox. It looks rather pristine, right? It's a tail of two boomboxes, really. I actually got two of them dirt cheap off eBay. Dirt cheap considering what a real boombox goes for. And they were only $2 apart and only about a week or two apart on eBay, freshly listed. So why do I have two? Very interesting. Um... The first one was a 1983 model that was the A version. And I fully restored it and got it all back together. But I had an odd problem with the cassette deck. First we'll open this to show you. This uh, plastic decorative piece in here was horribly warped. So it was actually pushing out the cassette so it wasn't seating properly. That's the only thing that's bad about vintage anything, any era. You don't know its history. Well, it, as they used to say, it's causing my tapes to skew and get eaten. Luckily, there's only one tape, and it was one I just freshly recorded, so it was nothing lost. I could just remake it, which I have done already. So out of desperation and trying to troubleshoot the problem and finding that, I ended up taking a Dremel tool and cutting that decorative piece out. And... This piece here is actually aluminum. I mean, these are really well made, you know. This is not a sticker. Well, even in doing that, I still had the tape finally was seating correctly, but I had a, it still had the tape skewing, especially at the beginning of the tape and wrinkling the shit out of it. Well, I can't pinpoint the problem, but I think it was the take up real clutch. I took the whole thing apart and I thought it was behaving like I had way too much torque on playback. For what reason, I don't know. I checked everything over. I ended up, it's just a, basically a felt washer in there. Well, I um, merely trimmed down the felt washer to a much smaller size. And yes, that fixed the tape eating problem, but during playback, the tape was still skewing. Something may have been bent on it. I don't know. I don't know the history. So out of frustration, since I already was upset, I cut this piece out because I, I wanted the tape deck to work. I looked on eBay and bam, comes the B version. This one, the B version, the date code said 1984 on it. But in, the, in getting that, I was able to take two of these boom boxes Use parts from each to make one pristine unit. And that's how this one came about. Now, I'll just go over things that have been changed on this one. Okay. It's, it's basically a 50-50 split of what is shared on each. Okay. Now, the B version, the second one I got, had a cracked display. As you can see right there. So I took the A version, removed the face, the you know, plastic face plate from there and put it on this one. The other thing is the A version had better condition knobs, like they had some dings or scratches on, on it. So I swapped those over. The A version also, or sorry, the B version, this one here had a scratch right there. The A version was pristine. Okay, uh, the speaker grills. When I was restoring the A version, its speaker grills were horribly marked up. So these are actually been, these have actually been spray painted black. And I'll show in the video right after this me spray painting them. So the original ones that were on this B version were this. 
is actually more of a dark gray, but the A version had like, it was like almost black, but look at the problem. I had a few marks on it and something got splashed on it right here and literally ate the paint off. This was actually rust. So I figured, well, you know, I've already painted these. I might as well just swap them over. That's speaker grill number one. It is being repainted. Yeah, now that I got off, these plastic uh, prying tools are great because I, I, I'm not messing up the plastic here as I pry this up. See, see, look how marked up it is. You know, I thought maybe, you know, it kind of wouldn't look that bad, but no. It looked pretty bad. I'm like, no, there's something more I can do with this thing. Oh, yeah, look at the inside of here. It's just rusty in that one corner. Okay, that's two down. All right, but things kept going, okay. Uh, the A version had a um, broken piece on the battery connector, this one doesn't. The A version had a, the back was very yellowed. This one's not, this is the B version. And uh, the other thing is the B version, being that it came out of General Electric's own facility, came with this particular power cord, it actually says GE on it. The A version had a standard boombox cord you find across multiple brands. So let me get into everything that's been going on here. So yeah, I talked about the speaker grills. So yeah, I have a nice parts unit. Replaced this, replaced this, replaced this. Um, another thing, the only electrical difference I could find between the two, there's a metal shield in behind here now that's grounded around the buttons. That's the only difference I could find. Now, when I got the B version, the tuner, which is this guy right here, something was wrong with it. It did not work. It barely worked pulling in any stations. So instead of spending more time troubleshooting what is the problem, I merely swapped boards. So this one is out of the B version. And yeah, it's probably something simple. It could be a cap. It could be... You know, or, you know, it's anything on this board, it could be. It was just quicker to swap it out. This is still the digital tuner and clock module from the A version. Uh, this is all A version. Uh, here is the A version speakers. I cleaned it the best I could, but the chrome... But the chrome on it is really pitted and looking. I couldn't get it any cleaner. This one is pristine. So here's what the back looks like. You see where I cut that out. I was just getting desperate. I mean, the whole reason I get into a vintage boombox is the cassette players. These are not what you think. They're very well made and they perform the part. Now, that said, the last thing that happened, and I might not be able to get this off the power cord here, but you see that? That's glue residue. And you're asking, why is there glue residue on it? See, I, I can't really scrape this off. It doesn't want to come off it. Well, this piece here plugs into the back part was broken off. So you plugged it in. Yeah, it was plugged in. But if you bumped the power cord, it just simply fell right back out. So I swapped that part. It was also easier to swap the entire power transformer over to that one. However, the Funai made one, it, uh, the, connect, the, the connector, the AC and the DC in connector right here, uh, was this, had light, you know, that little black stuff is glued, just dab there, dab there, and you're done. GE Singapore really likes to use glue. It was glued in all the way across the top here. I had to get, it was so bad. And being that I don't care, it's already broken. I had to get the Dremel tool out and cut it out of that one. And then I was able to pull this one out and swap it over. So that one has that input board with this on it and the power transformer. This power transformer is out of that one. So yeah, like I said, it's more of a 50-50 split at this point. This is the tape deck out of this unit. I'm not sure on who made it, 
but it's another very well-made unit with um, music search. It does have not necessarily a solenoid, but a um, magnet that it energizes to hold it in fast forward or rewind. Uh, it has a flat belt to drive a heavy flywheel and once again gets fantastic performance. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, the tape transport in the GE Blockbuster and the realistic, a lot of the, the other ones I have, the, I have another boombox I gotta demonstrate, the realistic powerhouse, which is a clone of the Blockbuster, and the modular 1000, they're all used the same tape transport. Well, the manufacturer was GEC. Can't find any info on it, but the cool part is, this exact tape transport was used in Tascam four track recorders. So that just shows you how well it, what performer it is. The problem with this is age. There's a couple of failure parts with age at crack or whatever, which I've learned about and I'll show in another video. But as for what this tape transport is, I don't know. I'll have to do some digging to find out. Now, as to why GE started producing this in their own facility, it appears to have been maybe a one-off, like there are no clones of it or anything. And the differences are they did like, they got the circuit boards in, but they used like a different supplier of parts, like caps and resistors that line up more of what you'd see in a G, a G actual GE clock radio. Not a bad thing, it's just you can tell they used the same suppliers at that facility. So it's like they got the boards and they assembled it themselves. It's probably because it was a one-off unit, so they took in the parts. The only other difference I noticed would be like the wiring harnesses in here. The GE in their own stuff, like the UZs, but Funai like the UZs and these rainbow colored ones. Like you see on the speakers here too. And if you'll notice those exact wiring harnesses are on the Blockbuster and the Modular 1000 because they're all Funai OEM'd. So yes, that is the tale of two boom boxes. Now let's go over the features. As mentioned, this has the exact same woofer, mid-range, and tweeter as um, the Blockbuster with the famous big silver chrome, or with the famous chrome dust caps, the large ones. It looks, it just looks beautiful. I mean, as those, those larger chrome dust caps really make, make the appearance of it look fantastic. And um, so, Yes, it is. Um, it has the music's location system one. So it only, this one only does one song at a time. FM stereo, all your tuning controls here. It's five station presets per band. Auxiliary line level in radio and timer, which I'm going to demonstrate. And that's the other thing I'm finding out. On the Blockbuster, the loudness switch is more of, say, an equalization switch for the speakers. Because this does not have a loudness switch, but it performs exactly the same as if the, it was the Blockbuster with the loudness switch in. And that's that's not a bad thing either, because, I mean, even though it's like that, you can crank this thing up to about here before it starts distorting. And even then, it's like very, very loud. These things really perform. Soft eject. Well, in case here, it's cushion eject. But, you know, back this is back when <laughs> cassette decks were high quality, though, and not the Tennyson kind. Um, so, yeah, these are all feather touch controls. Yeah, so, up top here. Now flip it around. It still weighs quite a bit. So yeah, you have your aux in. So A and B just changes the oscillator frequency for recording AM because sometimes you get a beat noise in the audio. Now, I, this is one thing I always like seeing. It says performance speaker system on the back. When I was researching these, um, 
it looks smaller than what it is. It's actually larger than the Blockbuster. Okay, let's open up this compartment here. To keep the clock running, it takes two AA batteries and the memory. Just use carbon zinc because it's, it's such a low current draw. Otherwise, it takes 8D batteries. But again, this is a powerhouse. And as you can see, there's the B in the model number. And on the side here, This looks like it was that glue that was on um, the uh, power cord, which I can't get off on here. It's like embedded in the plastic, so it would be causing more damage. But luckily it's in a spot that's not really noticeable from the front. So let's give this thing a quick try out here. All right, so this will be uh, radio operation. Great. Michael Jackson put out a whole lot of great tunes back during the 70s and 80s. Uh, my opinion, this is his best. Here's Michael and Man in the Mirror. I'm gonna make a change. <laughs> this station's rather far away, like 50 miles away. And um, it's a weak transmitter too, but this one picks it up fine. In fact, look at the, uh, even when you look on AM, has, look at that tuning, um, loop stick antenna in there. It's rather large. So, yeah, I have that in memory three because it's been cloudy today, but on clear days, it really picks it in nice and clear. That's why I switched it to FM monorail. GX with convenience and available advanced technology features that make every journey more thrilling. New it can be. On sale now, produced by Live Nation and DVD. Spring break is here, and summer will be here before you know it. So now's the time to start planning your next great adventure. But. It'll do a scan. After the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, another... My mother, you know, I was about to give up. We sell them for less. Your deal, your way. Far further away. Um, so yeah, we'll do AM now. Your home this will is never get KDK. really clean, by the way, if you don't get those ducts too. Take 75 bucks off your air duct cleaning, and again, make sure everything in your house. You gotta press and hold to make it tune like that. There we go. 17th, you gotta worry about beating someone. We're in our reception place for AM. Remember when Radio Disney used to be a thing? That used to be AM 540 around here. Bieber air music. Well, the 
Played out to the neutral zone for a while. Three week quick stop. Off to that murdering, dictating thug Maduro. Oh, in a nutshell, the E in L stands for electronic. It's electronic mail. And the person credited by many historians with creating and sending the very first email was an early computer pioneer named Ray Tomlinson, who, in 1971, sent that first email. The message itself was garbled. Tomlinson was just testing it and reportedly just typed the top row of letters on the keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P, and that was the very first email. More stories in our Knowledge in a Nutshell books, 1-800-NUTSHELL, or go to knowledgeinanutshell.com. Information, conversation, and why it matters. I don't have good reception, but I'm doing it out in the kitchen near a window. That's better than normal. Alright, so that's FM radio demonstration. FN and AM. I should just say radio demo. So it has a very good tuner in it. And um, I said it for an early '80s boombox is very unconventional. Now um, I want to check out the timer functions, which I have not tried before. Um, now I, I have a feeling I know exactly how it works. There's an on timer and an off timer, and you could either turn it on with the radio. You could probably turn it on with the cassette record of the cassette to do timer recording of the cassette and we're going to try that in a minute but that said one thing you're going to wonder is you know this this machine you know is even more of a beast than the blockbuster but the tape deck took out some features like you know chrome metal selection you know, stuff like no stereo wide function or um, dolby that's because this was just the beginning of the ones they deem the ETS electronic tuning system. The model above this is the 3-6045. And that one is extremely rare. And that one is yet another Funai OEM unit. But I can insert a picture of it here. It's rather blurry. It's off of Wiki Boombox. But there is a Telefunken, German Telefunken branded version of it that was oem'd by funai there's one on ebay now just observe everything on here like the lcd display it's identical even all the buttons for the tuning and time controls are identical five station memory and yeah you know, the tape transport is the same but it has everything else that this doesn't have like dolby manual and automatic level controls that's stereo wide i mean pretty much everything a higher end boombox would have well it's not just features on that one i can't tell from the pictures the size of the um speakers they may be eight inch ones but they still have that famous large chrome dust cap food i used but the power rating on that one is 12 watts RMS per channel. Yeah, you pretty much went in the top tier territory there. And I figure if this one can sound like it's twice the power it's rated for, I'm afraid to know what that one is. I mean, and it has the same, people have reviewed it say it has the same characteristics as this, the low, deep, warm bass and the crystal clear treble response, you know. So I am gonna keep my eye out for hopefully the GE version. Worst case, I can always um, import 
one from Germany, <laughs> the Telefunken. But even then, that one there was going for 525 US dollars. Real boom boxes are an expensive hobby, especially if you need to get a parts unit. The, even the parts units go for a lot of money. One was $57, the other one was $59. I got very lucky because these typically sell anywhere from the $200 area and up. And it's a very underrated boombox, that's for sure. It really performs and it looks that way too. It just looks so cool. So let's try the tuner timer functions. So we're gonna set the on and off times on this. So first thing we did, we gotta do, press the display button, on time. You have to press this to time set it so on time blinks. Press stop to insert it. Now we're going to take it down. We'll start at 8.36 p.m. Press stop. That just... Okay, okay, I see. You can actually clear it clear so you don't have it. Now press that. Now we'll go off time. Press that, press stop, and we'll make it turn off at 8.37 p.m. All right, All right. still figuring it out. <laughs> so I'm gonna put on timer, turn it up a little bit. So it should turn on in less than a minute. And it turns off. Pretty cool. Now let's go get a cassette tape. Go easy if you can. It's been a long week. All right, just be safe and everything. But let us know what you're up to. Give me a shout out. I'm um, right here. You can use that talkback mic on the iHeartRadio app. Get a message right in. It might hear yourself on the air. Twisted Sister on the way, DVE. This weekend, you get to pick the songs for an electric lunch Saturday. Guaranteed. 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 On DVE. Start your career as a table games dealer at Rivers Casino Pittsburgh today. Earn over $20 an hour with no experience necessary. Training is free and you'll be paid while you learn and grow your skills. Discover an array of benefits like paid breaks, growth opportunities, tuition reimbursement, and so much more. Visit RiversDealerSchool.com to apply and enroll in dealer school today. Rivers Casino Pittsburgh. Must be 18 years or older to apply. Rivers Casino is an equal opportunity employer. Shuts off just like that. So that's how you would timer record shows with this thing. So I'm gonna play back what we just recorded. Safe and everything. But let us know what you're up to. Give me a shout out. Uh, I'm right here. You can use that talk back mic on the iHeartRadio app. Get a message right in. It might hear yourself on the air. Twisted Sister on the way, DVE. This weekend, you get to pick the songs for an electric lunch Saturday. Guaranteed. 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 On DVE. Start your. So, yeah. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. So, yeah, even after that quick demonstration of um, the timer functions. So it looks like, yes, you can set it to record off the radio at a certain time and turn off at a certain time. You can just simply have the radio turn off and on at a certain time. And uh, you can play back a cassette at the same time, you know, whatever time you set. And I notice if you do that and it's the tape is shorter than the time you give it, if auto stop hits, it'll go back to the radio, whatever station it was set to. So I'm taking it in this room here, a little bit better acoustics the carpet and everything um plus uh, a lot quieter in here to demonstrate the cassette this is a tape i record on the modular 1000 
It is a actually a chrome tape too. But I also took it in here on purpose to show you how much larger it is than the Blockbuster. And the Blockbuster is already a relatively large boombox. But you can see it has the same speakers and some of the same uh, cosmetics if you look at it. Including how the microphone slots are. demonstration of the how would I even consider since it's like a 50 50 model 3 dash 60 35 a slash b from 1983 slash 1984 making a pristine unit out of two and it works fantastically and like I guess it's it's pretty large it's it, it but it performs it says performance speaker system it it performs all right. It's a real boombox. So thanks for watching and uh, hit like and subscribe.